Christmas is a reminder that the God of heaven and earth is Emmanuel, God with us. As God with us, he saves us from our sins, fills us with his Holy Spirit power to be his witnesses and empowers us to live an overcoming life. As God with us, he is indeed wonderful, our counselor, the mighty God, our everlasting father and the prince of peace. Thank you. Please be seated. Looks like uh, my cheerleading team is there, hooting and whistling. We always travel together. <laughs> oh, you know, I was just wondering when to come up. My throat was going a little dry, even as, <laughs> you know, Pastor went on with the introduction. And um, yeah, it's so good to be here. Uh, like Pastor said, you know, the first time we came, um, uh, our daughter was not yet born, and uh, Aati was expecting. and. And uh, we came, and the church was about, um, I think, two, three families. Uh, so it's wonderful to, you know, see uh, God's goodness and faithfulness in the ministry. And, of course, pastor has been a you know, source of great inspiration and motivation, and uh, praise God for that, right? Um, you know, the Christmas message is really uh, a tough one, uh, especially for people who are veterans. You know, you've, been, you've heard the message so many times. And um, especially in, when, we, you know, when we start with December, the month of December, you've heard the stories, you've sung the carols, you know all the facts, and, uh, and you're just sitting there, you know, waiting for the service to get over and get to those cakes, right? So, uh, I know it's a tough one. And, um, you know, especially the nativity plays. How many of you have been in a nativity play? You know, just put your hand up. Uh, you know, the Christmas story, the Christmas... Uh, yeah, only a few? Okay, many, many hands, yes. Um, so you've been in that, so you know. Uh, I remember the nativity play uh, which I was in. Uh, the first time, it was all a blur. You know, the nativity play is very interesting. There's a hierarchy, if you don't know. You know, first, you don't get to be the wise man. Or you don't get to be the king, you know, get, get to be Joseph. Uh, you start right from the bottom. You get to start as the sheep. <laughs> How many of you were sheep? Yeah. Not me. I got a wild card and uh, I was an angel. Can you believe that? Uh, they made me wear a white dress. I'm not very proud of it, but I wore it that day. And I, I don't remember how old I was, but uh, white dress, wings, and uh, I just had to stand. And it was all a blur because, uh, you know, in this nativity place, the real ha heroes are the children church ministers. Any children church ministers here? You know, they're just guiding the people. They're just saying, okay, you move here, you move there. And, and I was there standing in one place and uh, feeling very hot and sweaty. And, and they just asked me to smile and I had to turn. And, and before you know it, it was all over. And they said, you did a good job. <laughs> yeah, this was before the days of YouTube. So otherwise things would have gone viral and, uh, you know, <laughs> nominations and whatnot. But uh, we, was, we were saved from that. But the thing is this. That we all know the facts, we all know the stories, right? We, we've heard it so many times, we've read it so many times. And, but today, friends, Romans countrymen, lend me your ears, <laughs> right? Do not switch off. Sit at the edge of your seat and pretend that you're hearing it for the first time. Amen? Amen? Right. So you pretend that you're hearing it for the first time, edge of the seat in all wonder. Actually... You know, may we never lose the wonder of the Christmas story. Amen. You know, so many times we hear it and also things have become so commercial, right? You go to, you enter into any mall and you see reindeer, snowflakes, you know, some things which are completely alien and, and things are very commercial and it's possible that we become jaded. When we listen to Christmas, when we listen to the Christmas story, we become kind of Jaded, I've heard it all. What's new in it? But today, you are sitting at the edge of your seat, yes? And listening as if you're listening to it for the first time. And maybe capture that wonder of that first Christmas. I'm just reminded of that song, which goes like this. Wide-eyed, mystified, may we be just like a child. Staring at the beauty of the king. May we never lose the wonder. May we never lose the wonder. Christmas is wonderful, it's also astounding, astounding. Because when we look at the facts, some of the facts 
around Christmas, some of the things about the birth of the Lord, some of the details which are there, it's astounding. Because you realize that something has happened which is remarkable. Remarkable. Never before in history. Something unique, something significant that has shifted the whole of history. That has changed mankind forever. And one of those things is that the birth of the Lord, the details considering the birth of the Lord. When we say birth of the Lord, of course, we're talking about God being incarnate as human being, right? It's not like he had a beginning during that first Christmas time. No, he's God, eternal God, stepping into time, stepping into our world and being God incarnate. So when we look at some of those prophecies, his birth was foretold. The birth of the Lord Jesus was foretold. Um, you know, when, when a couple is uh, maybe expecting, you know, maybe uh, 10 months before or 6 months before, you know, you get to know and people, they tell you, yes, we are going to have a baby. And, or maybe others notice and then they say, yeah, they, they are going to have a baby, they're expecting, etc. But this birth was foretold, guess how many years? Guess how many years? Centuries, right? Approximately maybe seven or eight centuries. His birth was foretold. And we're going to look at some of those uh, prophecies that were foretold. And we're going to look at some of them which were fulfilled, right? All of them which were fulfilled. So the first one is that his birth was a supernatural birth. A supernatural birth. Not a natural birth, a supernatural birth. A supernatural conception, a miraculous one. He was born of a virgin. The book of Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14, it says, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. The virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And this fulfillment is recorded for us in Matthew chapter 1. And I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 1 and verse 20 where it says, But while he thought about these things, talking about Joseph, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son and you shall call his na name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. Verse 22. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled. Which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet centuries ago. Saying, behold. And Matthew quotes from Isaiah chapter 7. And he says, behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel which is translated, God with us. So his birth was foretold and it was fulfilled exactly in the same manner in which it was foretold. And secondly, we see that the place of his birth, he was born in Bethlehem. The place of his birth was also foretold. We look at uh, Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. Um, it reads like this. The Micah was a contemporary of the prophet Isaiah, and, and he writes, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. And the fulfillment of that prophecy we see in Matthew chapter 2, verse 1, and verses 4 to 6, it says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. Verse 4 says, And when he had gathered all the chief priests, he's talking about this king Herod, when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, 
in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So we see that the place of his birth, and it's interesting how it comes about, that Joseph and Mary, and Mary is found to be with child, and there is a, a decree, a government order which goes out that they need to register. They need to register their names, and they need to go from where they were to Bethlehem to register. It's like a government order, you know, saying, everybody go get your Aadhaar cards by this day. Right? Everybody go, you get it. And everybody, there's a, you know, there's a flurry, there's a busyness activity, and everybody's scurrying here and there. And that's what happened. So Joseph and Mary went there, and Luke chapter 2 talks about it. Joseph went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. So the place of his birth came to be, it, it came like a government order. It came like something they were fulfilling in the natural, but actually they were fulfilling a prophecy, something that was foretold seven centuries back. Ama amazing. Just want to, as an aside, encourage us you know, sometimes we do some things in the natural and we think, what's the use of this? But actually, the word of the Lord, what God has spoken over your life, even what seems to be mundane, natural things, God will fulfill that. All it takes is obedience. Joseph was obedient, right? He said, okay, I will take Mary to be my wife. He was obedient. He was obedient to that, that command. And even so, as we choose to be obedient, as we choose to please God, even when we do those mundane natural things, we will see the word of the Lord fulfilled in our lives. Amen? Amen. So it need not be always spectacular and, and grand and so on. In the simple things of life, the word of the Lord will be fulfilled among us. Okay, so the third thing is also a tragic incident that happened where um, it's recorded in Jeremiah that innocents will be slaughtered. That innocents will be slaughtered and there will be a lot, of, uh, a lot of weeping in a place called Rama, which is in the vicinity of Bethlehem. And we see that fulfilled when we read about uh, that in Matthew chapter 2, where Matthew chapter 2 and verse 16, then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry and he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all its districts from two years old and under. Verse 18, the, the writer refers to Jeremiah 31, 15, and he says, A voice was heard in Rama, lamentation, weeping, and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted. So even this was something that was foretold and fulfilled and around the birth of the Lord Jesus. And what's again interesting is that his name, that was also foretold and was fulfilled. His name. Um, in uh, Isaiah chapter 7, we, we read that verse. It says here, that the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21 to 23. And she will bring forth the son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Verse 22. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. So that name, that wonderful name, Emmanuel, which means God with us, was foretold hundreds of years back and fulfilled during that time. 
fulfilled during that time. And the name was given because it bears significance. And I just want to read that verse again. It says, uh, the angel comes and, and tells um, Joseph, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And the writer, he says, behold, you know, this was fulfilled. What was spoken by the Lord to the prophet uh, was fulfilled. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. So the angel comes and says, you call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And the prophecy is that he shall be called Emmanuel, because he is God with us. So as God with us, there are certain things that, that he does. As God with us, there are certain things he does in our lives. And that very name bears significance. Right? He was named Jesus. Jesus means savior because he will save his people from their sins. So today, this morning, when we even consider that name, ponder the name Emmanuel. Emmanuel is God with us because he will save us. He is God with us to save us. So you might be wondering, what should I be saved from? What must I be saved from? You know, the Bible says that when God created, he created everything perfect. It was good, it was perfect. But the Bible also says because of disobedience, sin entered man. And sin brought with it death, sin brought destruction, all kinds of wickedness that we see around, sin brought. But he's Emmanuel, God with us, to save us from sin. To save us from the consequences of sin. You know, the Bible says that death came in because of sin. Death came in because of sin. You know, we see a lot of things happening around. Wickedness. It came because of sin. In John chapter 10, the Lord Jesus says, The enemy has come to steal, kill and destroy. So we see a lot of stealing, killing and destroying happening. Selfishness, and bitterness and lust and, and all that. Wars and killing. And, and the Bible says that it's a manifestation. It's a fruit, an outcome of something which is deeper, which is sin. And the Lord came to fix that. The Lord came to change that. But it takes a savior to change that. It takes a savior to pay the penalty for that sin. You know, sin separates us from God. Sin separates us from God. It's like a wall between us and God. Sin separates us. Um, you know, our nephew is about, uh, is going to be two years in, in March. And uh, sometimes they bring him and, you know, uh, bring him to his grandmother's place and, and uh, keep him there and so that the parents can, you know, finish their work and so on. So he's a live wire. He's always, you know, moving around. And every now and then, you know, he realizes mama is not there. And he'll come and ask, mama? And then, you know, that reassurance, yes, mama will be back. Mama's coming. And when mama comes, oh, wow, there's a celebration. Right? He just goes and, and he's smiling and he's jumping. And just so that he sees mama come back. He's so happy that mama's back and he's restored with mama. Sin separates us from our relationship with God. You know, to, just to uh, explain that again, how many of you have been lost in a mall? You know, you were a child, you went out shopping somewhere and you got lost. You went with your parents or guardians, whatever, and then, you know, you got lost. And you're looking around. And uh, maybe you thought someone was your parent and you went and pulled their hand. And, uh, and, you know, and, and they looked down and, and you realize, oh, no, no, wrong number. Right? How did you feel when finally you were re reunited with your parent? So relieved. So happy. Maybe you cried. Right? And maybe they, they came and just, parents just came and reassured you, saying, it's okay, mama's there. It's okay, dada's there. We are fine. You know, we, everything is fine. Everything is going to be all right. 
You are so happy. You are so at peace. Sin separates us from our Father God. Sin separates us from our Father God. We might be doing several things to get connected because we are born in this world with this sense of separation. We are searching. Oh, something is missing. Uh, I need to find that something is missing, but I'm not able to put my finger on it. Maybe I'll, if I try this, you know, this career path, maybe that will work. Maybe if I go to a higher position, that will work. Maybe if I buy this house, maybe if I buy this, this brand new car, maybe if I wear this perfume, you know, maybe that will help. Maybe if I get married to that person, oh, I should have got married to that person. You know, you try all that and you're saying, maybe that will help. But deep inside, there's something else. It is sin that's separating us from God. And nothing else will satisfy because it's a spiritual connect. It's a spiritual connect and we cannot do anything in the natural. We cannot try other things materially to, to satisfy that. It's a spiritual connect. And it's only the Lord who can bring back that connect. It's only the Lord who can do that. He's called, he's God with us to bring us, to reunite us back to himself. Sin, the penalty for that is death because God is a holy God. Sin separates us here on earth, but eventually sin also would separate us from God permanently. And God so loved us that he came and he carried that penalty for sin upon himself on the cross. Because no one else can pay. Because everyone coming into the world is coming tainted with sin. Is coming broken. Is coming separate from God. But Jesus was the only person who came, who was born sinless, who lived a sinless life, and he carried that penalty. That price, he carried it upon himself on the cross. And that is why, you know, this morning when we took part in communion, the Jews representing the blood that was shed and the wafer that we ate representing the body that was nailed on the cross. It was not just the physical suffering, but the sin of the whole world was put on him. And he paid that price. Just so we can be reunited. We can be connected back to him. And we can have what the Bible says, eternal life. It's being born again. It's like being born again. A fresh, brand new start. He is God with us to save us from our sin. He is also God with us to indwell us. Now that's another thing. You know, maybe you're saved from your sin. And he's saying, I have this life with God. I've made this decision. But the good news is this. He is God with us to indwell us. Not sitting far away and directing us. Not sitting far away and saying, you know, I'm going to be here. Now you figure out things in life. Now you get this done. No. He's saying, I want to be part of your life. I want to be with you. I want to be with you. And the Bible says that he indwells us. When we invite him, when we get back to him and say, Lord Jesus, I believe that, yes, you are the payment for my sin. And I invite you into my life. When we do that, the Bible says that he indwells us. You know, have you ever felt alone? All alone. All alone. You're so alone that your thoughts are so loud. But the fact is the Lord wants to step in in that scenario and he says, I want to indwell you. I want to be with you all the time. All the time. So that you will never be alone. John chapter 14 and verses 16 to 18, it says, um, these are the words of the Lord Jesus. And he says, I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. 
How long is forever? You know, when you're waiting for the class to end, that's forever, right? Sometimes the, the thing is in the classroom, the clock is over there and the students are facing you, and every now and then they turn, look at the clock, right? It seems like forever. I remember once um, in school, I you know, uh, was playing and during the lunch break, we finished lunch and then go play football and, and, uh, and then I tore my pant, right? And, uh, and I was so embarrassed, I didn't know what to do. I tried pinning it up, nothing would work. And for me, that second half was the longest ever. I, I got a definition of what eternity was, like, <laughs> I was just waiting. Every time the teacher comes, we need to stand. I was just hoping, oh, I, I, I hope that they won't ask me to stand. I hope we don't have to go out. I, I'm glued to my desk. My pants are torn. You know, how long is forever? The promise is that he will come and indwell and abide with us forever. That he may abide, stay with you forever. In the good times, in the bad times, especially in the bad times, especially in the challenging times, especially when you, when you feel that, hey, I'm all alone, there's no one there. He is there to abide, stay with us forever. In all seasons of life, you know, whether you're a young person and, you know, in, and everything is going fine and, and you're just going through life, you're going to college, coming back and no problem about bills, it's all being paid for. And, uh, you know, you've got an ATM at home. I, I need that. I need this, you know, carefree. Whether you're in that phase or maybe you're older and you have responsibilities and some of these responsibilities are weighing you down. Or sometimes, you know, you're, you're senior, you're, you're, you're a senior person and, and maybe there are cares. Maybe there are worries. There are anxieties. Maybe there are, you know, things that are weighing you down. Whatever season of life you are in, he says that he will come and he will stay, abide with you forever. Abide with you, abide with us forever. The spirit of truth, verse 18, John chapter 4 and verse 18, he says, I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you. I will not leave you orphans, I will not come to you. But it starts with that decision to invite him. Says he will come, he will indwell us. God with us. He is God with us to indwell us. He indwells us to empower us. He indwells us to lead us. Many times we feel powerful in life, charged. But there are certain things that make us very powerless. Very powerless. And if that thing shows up, if that person shows up, you feel powerless you know that they push the right buttons to make you feel powerless. You know, how many of you watch Avengers and, you know, Superman and, okay, only a few hands. I know it's good not to lie in church. Uh, uh, you know, personally, I, I like Avengers. You know, it's, it's, a, it's this thing of good and evil. But if you, you know, the Superman, Man of Steel, for example, he's strong. Faster than a speeding bullet, right? Is it a bird? Is it a train? Is it, is it a plane? No, it's Superman. And where was Superman born? Huh? They were the planet. Krypton. Okay. Okay, I think we'll stop it here. <laughs> Maybe we should do a Christmas quiz. How many reindeer does Santa have? Oh, again, wrong number. Okay. Okay, the thing is this, that Superman, he is a man of steel, but there's something that makes him weak. What is that? Wow. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have any uh, gifts here, <laughs> but yeah, kryptonite. Kryptonite just weakens him, right? And Lex Luthor knows that. Kryptonite just weakens him. So I want to ask us this morning, what is our kryptonite? What is our kryptonite? What is our Achilles heel? You know? We are so strong otherwise. We are so accomplished otherwise. But put us in certain situations and, you know, and then suddenly you, you sense that, hey, there's kryptonite in the room. I'm getting weak. 
Maybe it's some fear. Maybe it's some challenge. Maybe it's some people. Maybe it's an addiction. Right? Some habit saying this. If this was not there, life will be, life will be just great. God with us. He is God with us to indwell us, to empower us. Because the Bible says he's our helper, our parakletos, the Holy Spirit. He comes to, to indwell us, to take hold of us and with us push away and move away that weakness that seems to haunt us. He indwells us to overcome, to empower us to overcome. He indwells us to lead us. And his leading is also in parts of righteousness. Um, Romans chapter 8 and verses 13 and 14 says, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. The Lord loves to lead us. He doesn't want to confuse us. He's just waiting to lead us. You know, in leading, we need to wait and hear and receive instruction. Yes or no? Yeah. In leading, there is that thing inside you where you choose, you make that decision, I'm going to follow. And then leading is effective. But if I make up my mind and I say, I'm curious to know where you want, to, want me to go, but we've already made the choice. I'm not going to go. I'm not going to obey. It's not going to be effective, right? So the Lord indwells us. He is God with us to lead us. He is God with us to empower us. He is also God with us to transform us. To transform us. This year, how many of you thought or thought to yourself, or said to yourself, I need a change. I need a change. Or I need, I need to change this, I need to change that. You know, I think I should mention about Indica Isaiah. Uh, some of you know, Indica is our car, was our car. Okay, Indica, uh, turbo, uh, right, uh, yeah, small car. And Indica Isaiah, you know, we, we had to let go of Indica Isaiah recently. Because Indica Isaiah, every ride made me pray. <laughs> every morning I would sit and say, Lord, please protect our tires and maybe go to church on time. And, and the dread, dreaded thing happened, you know, to go to South Jayanagar, you need to leave at least by, you know, sound check happens at 7.15, so we need to leave the house by 6.30 at least and, you know, go there. And so sat and turned the ignition and that's it, no noise, no life. Uh, so, Indica is always memorable. I remember certain, you know, certain, uh, maybe on a, at a, you know, another time we could talk about these stories, many stories about Indica is But the thing is this, that, you know, there are moments like that which cause you to um, say, man, I need change. Things need to change in my life. I can't be, you know, I can't be doing this over and over again. You know, I don't want to respond or react to situations like this. I don't want to be a failure. I don't want to live with regret. I don't want to live with pain. I don't want to respond or, you know, hit back. I don't want to be, you know, responding with anger and bitterness. I need change. You know, there are bosses in office which make you pray those prayers, right? Or maybe you're that boss. <laughs> they're, they're praying, oh, I need change. Right. You know, they're praying that prayer, we need change, I need change. Emmanuel is God with us to change us from the inside out. And that change is drastic change. It's called transformation. He indwells us to transform us. Just want to read from Galatians 5 and verses 22 and 23. It says, But the fruit of the Spirit, it's talking about the Holy Spirit, whom Jesus promised, who indwells us. 
The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, which means patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. The fruit of the Spirit or the work of the Holy Spirit. Right? The, the fruit, the full manifestation, the outcome, the result of the Holy Spirit is all this. He brings in love and maybe there is, there is a need for love. You're saying, I, I need to show more love. Or maybe we're saying, I need, to, I need some joy in my life. I need some joy in my life. Yes, things are tough, but I need some joy in my life. I'm getting up sad, going to bed sad. I'm living my life sad. I'm anxious, jumpy all the time. I need some joy in my life. He indwells us to transform us. And the fruit of that spirit is joy. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Self-control. The Holy Spirit, he is God with us to transform us on the inside out. And it's a present day reality. He will do it for us. He is just waiting to do that for us. Emmanuel, he is God with us to manifest his name. You know, this is the last thing and we'll close with that. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He indwells us to manifest, to display, to bring to pass these characteristics in our lives and through our lives. He wants to manifest that. He wants to show us that he's wonderful, which means that he inspires delight. He inspires admiration. He wants to restore that sense of wonder because he is wonderful. He wants to restore that sense of wonder. And I, I just want to you know, talk to us, those of us who have been following the Lord. And I'm challenging myself and I'm asking, what is my sense of wonder when it comes to the Lord? Have the troubles of this, you know, of this world, have they somehow punctured that sense of wonder? Is there a slow leak where worship has become a drudgery or ministry has become something that you need to endure and go through? And, you know, where is that sense of wonder? Because he is wonderful. He inspires admiration and wonder. Our God. His name shall be called Wonderful. His name shall be called Counselor. He's a counselor. The source of infallible wisdom. And all of us need that wisdom at some point in our lives. We come to some crossroads and we, we, we think, I need that wisdom. I need wisdom. I need counsel. And he is the counselor. He's the wonderful counselor. And some scholars say that these two words go together. Wonderful counselor. He's the counselor. And in counseling, he comes and he asks us some questions to expose what's in our hearts. You know, how many of you have been in a counseling kind of a situation, you know, marriage preparation, right, counseling? Um, so the counselor asks some questions. And if your response is pass, that counseling session is not going anywhere. Yes or no? Yes. We need to open up and share. So God, he is the wonderful counselor. So he's saying, can you trust me? Can you be transparent with me? Can you be vulnerable? Can you open up your life? He's the wonderful counselor. He's just waiting to manifest who he is as a wonderful counselor in our lives. He's wonderful. He's counselor. He's also the mighty God. The all-powerful God with unlimited power. He's all-powerful with unlimited power. 
mighty God, God incarnate. He's willing to show forth this power in our lives. In situations which demand that. We're saying, God, I'm at this place and nothing else will help. Nothing else will help. No human intervention will help God. No human wisdom will help. No human power can help. His name is Mighty God. He is Mighty God. The all-powerful one with unlimited power. He indwells us to manifest who he is, to manifest his name. He's also the everlasting father. The everlasting father. No matter how our earthly parents were or are, how good or how bad, he is the perfect father. He's the perfect parent. He's the everlasting, which means that there's no end to his fathering. He doesn't cease to be the father. He'll continue to be the father. The ever-present Father. You know, in today's day and time, it's, it's easy to be an absentee parent. Right? It's easy to be a Santa Claus. You know, you show up at some time, gifts, and uh, things are fine, and then we just move on. But he's not like that. The ever-present Father. He, sees, he never ceases to be the Father, the everlasting Father. And he's also the prince of peace. And that word shalom, it talks about happiness. It talks about well-being. It talks about healing, emotionally, physically, deliverance. He's the prince of shalom. And his reign is characterized by shalom. Amen. His reign is characterized by shalom. So he's just asking us to yield. He's just inviting us to invite him into our lives. So as we close, I just want to give an invitation. You know, if you're here and maybe you're here in church for the first time, you've never been, you know, in church uh, or maybe you've always been in church during Christmas time, right? You've always been uh, at a church service you always, or you are maybe a regular church goer. You know, I, I was a regular church goer and I, I am a regular church goer but the fact is that I was separated from God. I was separated from God. I did not come to that place of inviting Jesus into my life. But I used to go to church. I was in the choir, you know, doing all those churchy things, meeting you know, on Sundays, going back home, and maybe you are like that. Today's invitation is for us to come back to him. Come back to him. And let him establish that connect. Let him invite you or restore that relationship. So before we close, you know, we can pray and we can ask the Lord to come into our lives. So maybe this is your first time or maybe you've, you've always been in church. And I just want to uh, uh, just encourage you to make that prayer. Right? And say, Lord, come into my life. A prayer, it can be something like this. It can be, Lord Jesus, come into my life. I believe that you died for me on the cross. You took my sin. You took the payment, the penalty for my sin. I believe you died for me on the cross. And I believe you rose again. So that I could be restored back to you. I could spend eternity with you. So you could pray that prayer. You know, many years ago when I prayed that prayer, it was, it was not something, you know, it was not in a church kind of setting, but I was actually in a bus. I was coming back from a retreat and I was just thinking in my mind, Jesus, if you are real, you know, can you come into my life and change my life? And he did that. Right? And he did that. It was like finding my parent again after being lost. And today can be a day like that for you as well. To be reunited to come to that place of being restored to that relationship with Jesus, which is what that we've been longing for, which is what that we've been seeking. So can I just request us to, to bow our heads and, and close our eyes and, and let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you are Emmanuel, God with us. Lord, we thank you that you come so that we might have life. Lord, we thank you that you've come to take what was separating us from you, Lord. 
sin. Lord, you've come so that, Lord, you can move away. You came to move away the consequences of sin in our own lives. Death and destruction. Chaos and confusion, God. Lord, you've come so that we might have peace. We might have shalom. And this morning, Spirit of God, we pray that you would speak to each one of us. That you would speak to each one of us. So if you've never ever invited Jesus into your heart, I um, just want to encourage you to just talk to him. You know, as I'm talking to you, you know, you can talk to Jesus. You can say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I believe that you died for me on the cross. I believe that you took my sin on the cross. And I believe that you rose again so that I can be your child. I can have new life. I thank you. Come into my heart. Change my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, if there's, if there's anyone here and you prayed that prayer for the first time, right? Uh, we just want to see your hand. You know, if you prayed that prayer from your heart for the very first time, inviting Jesus. Can you just see your hand? We just want to, okay, there's someone there. Okay. Um, um, anyway, just put your hand up. We just want to pray with you and um, invite you uh, and give you some resources. Anyone else who prayed that prayer for the first time? Okay, sister here. Is someone here? Just, yeah, just put your hand up. It's okay. You can be seated. Just put your hand up uh, so that we can see you, please. Thank you. Um, yeah, right here. Just put your hand up and yeah. Right here. Uh, so we just want to give you a resource. There's something to help you. Uh, something to, there's a Bible in there and something to get, help you get started. Yeah. Anyone else? Anyone else in the balcony? And maybe you just thought that prayer, you didn't really pray it out. Okay, okay. Uh, there are a few hands going up in the balcony. Um, just want to request, uh, yeah, somebody standing right there at the back. Awesome. This is the best decision of your life. Okay, great. Maybe, maybe you can all stand. Those of you who made that prayer, it will be easy for us to spot. Maybe you can stand. God bless you. Thank you for standing. You know, I know uh, it's a courageous decision to stand, right, in front of anybody. Everybody's seated and kind of single you out, but then heaven is rejoicing today, yeah. Um, this gentleman here. Anyone else, you know, um, if you pray that prayer, inviting Jesus in your heart, um, you can stand or put your hand up and uh, God bless you. God bless you. Okay, I'm just going to invite the worship team up and we're going to close. Um, but we're going to pray for the other things, right? He's the Holy Spirit who indwells us. So uh, let's pray for God to just restore that sense of wonder, right? That, that we will be caught up uh, in our love for him. That when he speaks to us, that we'll be in awe and that we'll stay in that sense of awe and wonder, which is worship, really. Um, um, I remember I was telling you about my nephew, and yesterday we were talking to him, and, and I mean, we just met him, and, and he was playing with this hand towel, right? That's it. This hand towel, he would throw this hand towel and uh, try to catch it. He would throw it to us, but he, you see his eyes. It's as if it's, it's some great gadget. He's, it's, it's as of some video game. Um, He's just, you know, he's just in awe of it. And I just want to encourage us to come back to that place of awe and wonder when every time we open the word of God, we read it. Maybe it's a word that we've read so many times, you know, God so loved the world that we would see it and we would go, wow. I know there are people in the basement as well. You know, if um, there are folks in the basement and if you lifted your hand, um, can I ask one of the ushers to just go and see if there are any that are who are lifted their hands in the basement and uh, in the overflow area and we can give them the pack right okay um. okay let's just worship the Lord let's sing something why don't we all stand and just worship the Lord this time
mystify May I be just like a child Staring at the beauty of the King May we never lose the wonder Oh yes May I never lose the wonder Just make it our prayer and say, Lord, I'm going to be wide-eyed and just totally in love with you Wide-eyed, mystified May we be just like a child Staring at the beauty of the King Wide-eyed, mystified May we be just like a child Staring at the beauty of the King May we never lose the wonder Great is our God. May we never lose the wonder. Yeah. May we never lose the wonder. Yeah. We worship you, Lord. We just draw near to you, Lord. God with us, who dwells us, who empowers us. shall be called wonderful Lord draw us back to your heart draw us back to that place of being totally in love with you Lord draw us back to that place of Say, Lord. Everlasting Father, everlasting Father, no, we are not orphans anymore. We are in the presence of the everlasting Father, the everlasting Father, no, we are not orphans anymore. Jesus, Jesus, you are here with us. Oh, you are here. Come on, let's just sing the name of Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, oh Jesus, Jesus, Emmanuel.
you know, some of us have some needs and um, you know the very name that we just read you know, that satisfies those needs you know he's willing to just step in and satisfy and step in and meet that need okay so uh, just want us to extend our faith today and say lord you are here you are more than enough you are more than enough come meet me at the point of my need god maybe it's uh, something to do with our body the bible says that he took our sins he took our sickness on the cross and by his stripes we are made whole right so we just going to believe god that he would just softly touch us and rearrange what needs to be rearranged in our bodies and change what needs to be changed in our organs right down to the level of our you know, cells that he would change that just reach out to him and maybe it's something to do with finances Let's extend our faith and say, God, I need a breakthrough. You know, this is it. God can change it right now. Just one step. Just one step. But God can also put us on a path of recovery, which is many steps. But every step He ordains, He shows light on that step that you need to take, and it'll be the path of recovery, the path of restoration. So when you talk about finances it could be just an immediate thing or it could be a path of restoration so let's believe god for that let's believe god for you know those questions to be answered those things that you battled with maybe it's something to do with some intellectual thing and you're saying god you know i'm not able to put these things together oh he will answer he will answer so let's open our hearts today just lift up his name and lift up his name just reach out to him in faith and say lord i draw near to you i know that you will draw near to me and manifest your glory
the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his shalom today amen amen happy Christmas God bless you and I think we're going to wish uh, sing some carols or, I don't know <laughs>
lovely day. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also visit our website apcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.